Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, dear Mr. Wallenberg, on behalf of the European Institute at the University of Zurich, it is a great privilege to welcome you here among us, Mr. Uh, Wallenberg at the University of Zurich. Our university is proud and happy to have you here among us tonight. Your talk here is part of a long lecture series going back to Churchill's famous speech in 1946, which he gave in this university just one uh, floor above, with a long list of prominent representatives from the political, academic, and business world. The central topic of those talks has always been Europe. That will also be the case tonight. Sweden and Switzerland have many things in common, and they get confused mostly in the United States very often. But when it comes to European integration, our ways have parted some years ago. While your country in 1949, uh, uh, 94, decided to join the uh, European Union, and very recently even to join NATO, Switzerland did not only reject the EEA agreement in 1992, but has since then struggled to define its relations with the European Union. Sadly enough, until today, no answer in sight. Since then, the bilateral relations between Switzerland and the EU are a constant and for many people, meanwhile, a tiring topic. Many here believe it would be nice to solve this issue for the foreseeable future. But one thing is sure. Our own economic development depends heavily on the prosperity of the European Union. Therefore, we are having a profound interest in a competitive Europe that can maintain and secure its prominent place in the world. This is the topic we are going to talk uh, about tonight. You, Mr. Wallenberg, you are, of course, in a perfect position to talk about these issues. You are, in a long family tradition, the chair of the board of Investor AB, which was founded in 1916 by the Wallenberg family. Investor is the lead shareholder of Nordic-based global companies. In your activities, you are an engaged and long-term owner and investor, and you try to create value for your shareholders, but also for the society at large. It was esteemed, I read this somewhere, that through your network, your family indirectly controls about one-third of the Swedish gross national product, what is, of course, very, very impressive. This is probably unique in Europe, and maybe in the discussion afterwards, we might come back to this issue. It is planned that Mr. Wallenberg will give a kind of shorter presentation and then leave more room for discussion and questions. Besides being the chairperson of Investor AB and member of the European Roundtable of Industrials, you are also a member of the International Business Council and a member of the board of nine additional enterprises like ABB, Vice Chairman Ericsson, Deputy Chairman, the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering, the Tsinghua University's um, School of Economics and Management, and also a member, interesting, a member of the mayor of Shanghai's International Business Leaders Advisory Council. With the older topic, maybe we can come back uh, uh, later on. Uh, all these activities put you in a perfect position to talk about Europe and uh, its, its competit competitiveness. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. Please, the floor is yours, Mr. Wallenberg. Much better. Uh, Professor Kellerhaus, uh, what, what can I say? You gave most of my speech. 
uh, and and uh, you you imply the answers, uh, which I think is terrific. I I will I will no 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 no. I, I will I will try to continue where you started, but I I would like to turn to all of you first and say how delighted I am here today to to be here today. I see a number of friends here, uh, which makes it even more fun, uh, and uh, I also see the Swedish ambassador, uh, which is wonderful, and uh, I see a representative of. Uh, the next generation of my family, who's sitting over there, uh, which I think is, if, po if possible, even more great. <laughs> and you'll understand why uh, once I've been through this. But let me just start by saying that I truly feel very honored to be here. And I do want to thank you for, for inviting me and for the university to, to invite me and, and giving me this opportunity to reflect a bit on building a competitive Europe, uh, a topic which is extremely close to my heart. I'm not a politician, as, and as I'm not a politician, I, I have to say that I was a bit surprised to receive the invitation to, to give this lecture, as uh, it's one that normally is given by politicians. But being a passionate European and a business person, I also engage in this continuous dialogue to improve Europe's competitiveness. And I think, I truly think, in my role, it's my responsibility to do so. Not only because of the companies that I'm uh, engaged with, that being very European, but because, because Europe's overall competitiveness overall competitiveness is so dependent on business success. Without business, no jobs, no jobs, no taxes, no taxes to finance that strong social fabric that I think we're all very proud of. So I'll try to make some reflections on this very important pro to topic, building that competitive Europe. But first, if you allow me, just a touch of background about my family and our business model that, that was touched upon. Uh, what we call our ecosystem. Together with my brother Peter and my cousin, our cousin Marcus, we represent the fifth generation of the Wallenberg family. And it all started in 1856 when the first Wallenberg founded the first private bank in Sweden the Stockholm's Enskilda Bank. Like Switzerland, Sweden was a late bloomer in the industrialization process of Europe. And in the late second half of the 19th century, today's industrial giants, some of which are companies that we are associated with today, such as Ericsson, Atlas Copco, or ASEA, today's ABB, they were only startups at that time. Remember that, only startups. Startups that the bank financed. So it was more venture capital than what you would sort of tend to think. And uh, ultimately, the bank then became owners of these companies. In 1916, following a change of legislation, banks were not allowed to own industrial participations any longer. And so, the holding company Investor AB was formed by splitting off the industrial holdings of the bank uh, into Investor AB and put it on the stock exchange. And like that, the family became bankers and industrialists, not by design, but by default. The following year, 1917, the second generation founded the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, a non-profit foundation, non-profit foundation, with the purpose to support basic research and education at university level for the good of Sweden. In Swedish, landsgangnelit. In those days, every country was very nationalistic. You sort of dressed yourself in the national colors and so on, and they did. Yeah. Today, the Wallenberg Foundations are the largest owner of Investor, 
So when my cousin, my brother and I, when we wake up in the morning, our aim and what we focus on is how can we make sure that we develop those holding, those companies as well as possible. Because the better they do, the more dividends those companies, the more dividends ABB sends to investor, the more money will go to those, that non-profit foundation. And that foundation then gives support to universities for basic research. And of course, the idea is that that research will eventually trickle through down into society. And this is what we call our ecosystem. The companies develop, the earnings goes to the universities, this, and then society at the end of it uh, benefits. Through this, the Wallenberg Foundation supports Swedish universities with roughly 200 million euros per year, which is the, it's the second largest private do donator in Europe after the Wellcome Trust in Britain. Now, in being an owner, it's of course fundamental for us that those individual companies are competitive. And to create competitiveness, our businesses are guided by a combination of long-term thinking and a willingness to change, to live with the times. And this was captured, I believe, by our grandfather, Marcus Wallenberg, in 1946. He wrote to his older and more conservative brother, Jacob, trying to convince him that the family should sell their interest in a railroad and take the capital and invest into this new business of the future called airlines. And that was the beginning of SAS. He wrote to his brother, to go from the old to what is about to come is the only tradition worth keeping. To go from the old to what is about to come is the only tradition worth keeping. Well, he managed, by the way, and SAS was formed. And this principle to look at the future has served many companies quite well over the years. So it's all about continuity on one hand and change on the other. And that, of course, brings me to the topic, Europe, and how to build a competitive Europe. When Churchill delivered his lecture, he spoke about how to recreate the European fabric and the kind of a United States in Europe. His focus was to prevent the atrocities of the Second World War and to have them repeated. And as we all know, the core motivation of European integration has from its outset, outset also been the prevention of war, a principle that resonates, of course, even more strongly today with the ongoing war in Ukraine. Since the Treaty of Rome in 1958, the means to achieve this peace and unity has been economic integration. And since then, the EU indeed has become the most advanced economic integrated Euro, uh, region in the world. Sweden became a member in 95, nearly two decades ago. And for, for us, it was a difficult choice because of our non-aligned history. And of course, Sweden was already a strong industrialized nation with significant exports. But there is no doubt that the EU offered us a quantum leap in many areas, not only in trade, but also in being part of shaping that important future of Europe. By hopefully, hopefully, joining NATO soon, uh, leave that to others, <laughs> something I strongly support, Sweden will leave behind our neutrality, which, like Switzerland, has been at the core of our foreign and defense policy for the last 200 years. And one can say that Sweden is going through a major shift towards a full economic, political, and military integration with Europe and the other member countries of NATO. This is quite a change for our nation. 
In the last few years, Europe and the rest of the world has been faced with multiple crises, as we all know. The pandemic, Russia's war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, geopolitical tensions, but also, or rather also, the idea of the European Union sprung from a Europe in crisis. The crisis that Europe faced when Winston Churchill delivered his speech in 46, and when Robert Schuman wrote his European Declaration a few years later, that was, of course, it was a different nature than the one we're facing today. But I dare say that what Europe is now facing is also a crisis. I think we have a very significant challenge in front of us. This time, it's a crisis of competitiveness, or rather, lack thereof. Fifteen years ago, the EU and US were equally big by size of economy. Today, the US economy is 25% bigger than that of the EU and the UK together. 25%. Other signs. Since the year 2000, the EU has fallen from a joint first in industry global market share to third, behind China and the United States. Our share of companies in the Fortune 500 has dropped to third place. Well, the numbers are clear also when it comes to innovation. The EU's spending on or investment in research and development is significantly lower than that of our global peers. And we can see the results. Earlier this year, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute presented its critical technology tracker, which takes stock of global technological competition. China is the leading country in 37 of the 44 technologies evaluated. The US is its closest competitor, while the EU is painfully absent. Well, as you might have gathered, I'm indeed very concerned that Europe is lagging the global competition. And I believe that if Europe continues to fall behind, not only will our prosperity suffer, when European companies are not competitive and not growing, when we're lagging in productivity, investment and innovation, well, European jobs are threatened, which in turn affects our ways of living our abilities to tackle climate change, strengthen our security and resilience, and invest in the technologies of the future. So what then is the EU doing to remedy this development? Fit for 55, the Green Deal, the digital decade. We have seen many initiatives trying to boost Europe's innovation, accelerate the green transition, leverage the digital transformation, etc. And this at the same time as navigating the pandemic, supporting Ukraine and other sorts of crisis management. I applaud the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen for her leadership during these difficult times. But it's an alarmingly short road from here to 2030, which is the milestone for many of the current climate digital and, and energy targets. And Europe obviously still has a long way to go. As I said in the beginning, I'm standing here as a businessman, not a politician. But in my view, there's no doubt that if Europe is to succeed in our endeavor to strengthen our competitiveness, business and politics has to cooperate. We must be pragmatic, forward-leaning, and work hand in hand to tackle both current and future challenges. I have a few areas that I want to highlight, and I want to do so by referring to the European Roundtable of Industry, where I am a member. The ERT works to promote competitiveness and prosperity in Europe. The members of the ERT are CEOs and chairs from around 60 of Europe's largest companies in industry and technology. They're working with gathering, or we are get, uh, working on gathering practical experiences and reflections on Europe European business climate and competitiveness in practice. And we have identified what we see 
as the most important building blocks for developing Euro, a competitive Europe. And I, I'd like to mention five of those. First, the implementation of the European single market, the very backbone of EU's prosperity and industrial competitiveness. It celebrates its 30th anniversary this year, but it's still not fully implemented. 60% of the barriers that businesses report today are of the same type as the ones reported 20 years ago. The single market needs a vitamin shot by reducing, harmonizing and simplifying EU regulation. And also by prioritizing the capital markets union, initiated almost a decade ago, but compared to the US, the EU capital markets are still very fragmented, fragmented and underdeveloped. Second, pave the way for more innovation and promote entrepreneurship. Back to regulation again. We need a regulatory framework fit for purpose that allows for fast approval processes and for innovations to become commercialized in a timely manner. And I think we need more entrepreneurs, more early stage companies. And Europe must also strengthen and safeguard our role in setting global standards and be bolder in pioneering new technologies by engaging in more public-private partnerships and allowing for more innovation-oriented public funding. Third, decarbonize Europe by re-industrialization. Businesses are driving the green transition with fossil-free energy and innovative technologies. Europe will not reach our climate targets if businesses are not given the best prerequisites to deliver the green solutions needed. I think we need to boost public investments, incentivize private investment and upgrade EU-wide energy infrastructure to stimulate renewable energy sources and improve energy security. And there is a, sing a significant challenge here in relation to the US. They, in my mind, work with carrots. They work with incentives, they work with subsidies. I don't love subsidies. The <laughs> and they have the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA. While we in Europe, we work with regulations, with sticks, and consequently, Many European businesses are now moving production and investments to the US. And I think we need to support our European industry. Rather than adding more regulations, we should work more with carrots and less with sticks. Fourth, invest in digital infrastructure. Digital, 5G, connectivity is fundamental for modern industrial production, for modern medical care, automation in factories for reducing our climate footprint. But Europe has not invested enough in 5G. We're lagging significantly and there's a high risk that new jobs, expertise and value will end up in other regions with the obvious ones, the US, China, South Korea and India being well ahead. If our strong industry base is to fully benefit from digitalization, I think we need to incentivize investments in 5G and create a barrier-free regulatory environment. Fifth, upskilling and reskilling. At the end of the day, it's all about people. AI and new technologies bring fantastic opportunities, but they also cause concerns challenge our societies, and new technologies and new ways of working require new skills and new competencies. Projections suggest that within the decade, 100 million people may need upskilling or reskilling, and 20 million workers could face, could face displacement. So Europe needs to boost education, reskilling programs, and an EU immigration policy that meets our needs and compensates for the demogra demographics of our aging societies. These five areas implement the single market, 
more innovation, re-industrialize to decarbonize, digital infrastructure and upskilling and reskilling, I believe are fundamental to Europe's competitiveness. And so is speed. Our global competitors are moving fast, leaving Europe even further behind if we don't speed up. I know that the United States has other muscles because of its structure, being a federation of states rather than a union. Although I'm a firm believer of the EU working more as a federation, closer together than today, I understand that that's challenging. So what can we do? Well, I think we can harmonize, we can cooperate, and we can shape an even closer union among the people, peoples of Europe as it is stipulated in the treaties. One key point going forward today, just as Churchill said, is of course the relationship between France and Germany. In light of Brexit, this Franco-German bond, I believe, has to further grow in importance for the EU as a whole. In other words, they have to agree. <laughs> so to conclude, I believe that Europe must decide that we want to gain speed, that we want to compete, that we want to reinvent ourselves and strengthen our place in this new world order. I think with our progressive politicians, great businesses, innovative entrepreneurs and skilled researchers, we should be able to do so but the will to succeed must be even greater than the fear of failure. We are in a very challenging situation. That being said, we have come a very long way since Churchill gave his lecture here in 1946. Sir Winston concluded his speech with the words, let Europe arise. Yes, Europe has arisen. And what has been achieved is remarkable. We have created the conditions to live in peace and prosperity. But it is a fact that we are lagging. So to paraphrase what my grandfather Marcus wrote in 1946, I believe we must reinvent ourselves, go from the old to what is about to come, and address the future. This is the only way for Europe to regain a leading place in that challenging world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wallenberg, for this excellent uh, presentation. You raised many topics which we can now uh, discuss among us. Um, I might ask one two questions at the beginning to warm up a little bit in, on this very warm day. Anyway, um, my first question would be, you mentioned it somehow, if you look at the big international tech companies, there is not one European company. So they're all American or Chinese. What went wrong in the past that we missed that train? Have you an explanation for that? Um, I, I think there is, uh, I mean, China is always a, a special case because it's, it's, uh, uh, the government has basically unlimited resources and it's, it's very much an investment game. Uh, I believe that Silicon Valley and, whoops, uh, Silicon Valley and um, uh, the fact that the Americans have a much deeper capital market cr had created a fertile ground for, uh, on one hand, uh, brainstorming, uh, finding new innovations, but more importantly, finding a way of bringing them to the market or financing the development of products. That's why I mentioned in my talk that the capital markets union in Europe is so mm -hmm. important. We don't have that depth of the capital market. So it's not so much about that universities would be worse or better in Europe, it's, it's the transmission from university into the market. I would, I would believe that uh, Silicon Valley is, is, of course, the obvious example. It's a combination, mm. but th that's where it started. Mm. Then it, it's sort of fed on itself, and that's where we all go to learn uh, about the future. Mm. 
so, so uh, yeah. but, but that's how I read it. That's where it all started. They created the platform companies, as did the Chinese. That it's too late for us today. Uh, there was no one that had that capacity in Europe at the time. Some of the uh, telecom players possibly could have it, but in Europe, we're not allowed to merge uh, in, in countries. Uh, so we have a view in Europe that the consumer comes first mm -hmm. the whole time. And, and I'm a firm believer in, in basically protecting the ultimate consumer. But the problem is if you push that a bit too far, uh, companies, f telecom companies in Europe don't make money. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, there are, what, 100 telecom companies in Europe? In the, in the United States there are four, uh, uh, about as many people. Of course, it's much easier for them. To, to, to get economies of scale, develop something for the future. And we, we never really had that opportunity, which is one of the reasons I believe why we have not invested in 5G in Europe, never mind the invention uh, and so on. But uh, 5G is, is heavily underdeveloped in Europe. Uh, it's not basically, it's very limited availability. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to run a modern factory, a modern factory has lots of measurement points uh, it's it's uh, temperature and speed and uh, all kinds of things. There's so many that the Wi-Fi, ca it's too much for a normal Wi-Fi setup. Uh, 5G can deal with the amount of information, but then you need a 5G network. Mm. You can install one in your factory or you can hang on to the one outside, uh, uh, pro uh, provided by, by your telecom operator. We don't have that in Europe. As a consequence, European factories will not be as competitive as our peers in China or the United States. That's a fact here and now. In the meantime, when we sell spectrum for 5G to, to the operators, governments in Europe take very heavy fees for that. So when uh, the Italian telecom operators bought spectrum two years ago for 5G, it was so expensive that they could not afford to buy the telecom equipment for three <laughs> years because they had no more money. That's what we're the, the kinds of issues that we're talking about as a very down-to-earth pragmatic question. Mm. Some telecom providers then in the past relied heavily on Huawei equipment, right? And then suddenly the wind changed and the US and others said, don't do that anymore, this, 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 there is a competition first, but of course also there is the always this threat of espionage and that, you know, that the data are, are being transferred. How do you see the future cooperation with Chinese business entity in this framework where the government in a way can do everything, has access to everything and uh, protection of private data are, is, probably not in is probably inexistent? <laughs> I mean, the whole China question is very difficult. We'll just take the security part first, <laughs> <laughs> about the telecom uh, in, uh, in the Western world. Uh, I mean, it's obvious. Uh, if, if you have Chinese equipment, uh, you are running a risk of, of having a backdoor. Um, the problem with modern telecom equipment is that you, you, you install uh, a new box, right? and you say it's not been tampered with, it's perfect. The problem is they are being upgraded ev every week with new software. So every week you could basically install a real backdoor at your will. That's the problem with modern technology. Hence, that's the problem of buying a Chinese 5G equipment. Okay, and then can every country can make up their mind what they think is the, the, the way of do dealing with that. So we'll park that. When it comes to the whole question of dealing with China, uh, I, I think it's extremely complicated, obviously. Uh, we have the, the, the geopolitical situation, the U.S.-China. Um, the U.S., I th my personal view, I think the U.S. is going too far. Uh, I think Europe has to make up its own mind and not go copy-paste with Europe, uh, with uh, uh, the United States. I think that we need to have a relationship with China, a commercial relationship. We need a dialogue, we need a commercial relationship, we need to work with each other. 
Because I think at the end of the day, uh, there is a mutual dependency. Mm. Uh, and that goes for the United States as well. Yeah, for economic reasons. If we stop the exchange between our three sort of uh, uh, commercial centers, China, EU, the United States, that would create havoc in the world economy. Mm. Uh, unemployment, political turmoil, the works. I don't think that's in our interest. I don't think it's in the Chinese interest either. They are equally dependent on us. Let's not mistake ourselves. Uh, they need us. So I believe one has to work with that basis. We have to stand up for human rights. We have to stand up for our values. We, there has to be a level playing field. There are a number of things that have to be in place. But I think we could push for that. And I believe that's the way we have to relate to China as we move into the future. Inten when I, I, I travel abroad and uh, I speak to people somewhere out of Europe, I often hear that they say, we don't want to deal really with the EU. That's a weak club, right? The EU has only money in financing somewhere, but they have no power. They have certainly no military equipment, no army. What we need is, you know, the real thing. And that's why the Russians and the other always automatically turn to the US and bypass somehow Europe. Do you think Europe has, in order to become a stronger competitor worldwide, also more engaged in own defense? I told you the difficult question. <laughs> yeah, uh, the defense question, I think, uh, is what it is. It's a NATO-based uh, question. The, partly for the reasons you mentioned, of course, the EU has been toying around with the idea of a defense force of its own. I don't think there's a political support for that. Uh, I, I think one has to sort of fall back into the NATO okay. answer. But of course... The, the, the predisposition is that the United States does its part. Mm -hmm. If it does not, we need another discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with that. It's, obvi it's obvious. We have to make up our mind if we want to have a defense that makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. That's a political decision in every individual country. I believe it's quite fundamental in today's day and age. Unfortunately, Hitler showed... What happens if you, if you open up too much? Putin has done exactly the same. I don't think we should put ourselves in that situation. When it then, so I leave that. Uh, when it comes to Europe's uh, competitive, well, it's my speech. Yeah. Uh, it's your, Europe's competitiveness. Uh, of course I believe that Europe can be competitive. Uh, I, believe that, but I believe we can go into specific areas and be very competitive. Yeah, but we cannot only look at the old areas. We have to look into the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, important but, uh, we, can, we, we have to accept that we are behind. We have to accept that we have to do more than what we've done historically, mm -hmm. or we are, will continue on this slippery slope where we are right now. So let's wait and see the outcome of the U.S. election. Then otherwise, it was a next presentation uh, in, in, in two years from now. Now, I would like to open the floor. I have more questions, but it would be nice to have you, you know, being engaged in the discussion round. Please. I have one question. You, uh, you think that you, uh, Germany, Germany has to reindustrialize Europe? Do you think we need more nuclear power plants to do that? Do, 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 we do we need more planable power in Europe? Of course. It's quite fundamental. It's mathematics. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we need a balanced uh, um, electricity system, which, and I love uh, wind. I love sun. Uh, I'm not against that. To the contrary, the more the better. The problem is sometimes they don't work because there is no wind, there is no sun. The, and, and the way society works, we need uh, electricity the whole time. So you need planable. Uh, and today you have what hydro uh, hydropower uh, uh, and uh, uh, nuclear being the two re only, only real ones available. We hope for, for uh, hydrogen. We hope for different types of batteries. There's lots of hopes, but they're not there right now. In the meantime, we need to create that stable system. We have to do, 
uh, continue to build out the, the grid system. It's underdeveloped. It's not made up for all these wind farms and all of that. So, so there's a lot of things that have to be done, uh, but, but, but it's based on more planable uh, energy as part of the mix. Please. I have a microphone. Thank you so, for so much. Thank you for amazing dialogue and speech. It's impressive. And Mr. Wallenberg, um, when you're talking about fundamental causes of this uh, uncompetitive behavior of Europe, what would you say about American original DNA, like collecting and uh, gathering uh, brave, innovative, curious, and uh, very powerful people, just uh, at the DNA of the country. And at the same time, I'm l I met for the last 10 years many, many leaders of Europe, and they're talking only about cons conservative protection, so up opposite mindset, I would say. Maybe that's the point to discuss first. What would you say? Thank you. No, no, I think I'm, I'm an extremely strong believer in the whole sustainability question. I think it's fundamental. We, we are, my, my cousin, my brother and I are pushing the companies we are associated with as hard as we can uh, in that direction. Uh, fundamental. However, having said that, of course, if, if, if the only thing we're doing is doing the environmentally correct things, at the expense of, of uh, societal development at large, somewhere along the line you're going to have a, a problem. And then you, you, you run into political problems. Then you start to have ext uh, extremist political parties that are against that. So it's, it's the whole time a matter of finding the striking this balance between the different powers. And I, I, I think that it's perfectly possible. But I, I do get disturbed uh, uh, and I'll, 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 I'll be shameful, uh, I, the, the Swedish government refused to, to allow a new cracker to be built about five years ago uh, on the Swedish west, west Coast. It was to be the most modern oil cracker in the world. As a, building that would have meant that the total CO2 uh, uh, emission in the world would have gone down. But the government at that time governed by the Green Party of Sweden said no, with the logic that it would mean more CO2 in Sweden, and it was against Sweden's interest. I do not find that a very mature way of looking at a very difficult equation when the world has to deal with the, 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 the sustainability issue. And, and so we have to be able to move away from that kind of thinking and find that broader uh, uh, avenue forward, still with sustainability in, in significant focus. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but we have to do all of these things in parallel, or, or we will have societal problems. There to the right, please, that gentleman. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, presentation so far. Uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, Germany and France, the relationship of Germany and France. Germany is seen as a sick man in Europe right now. What would be the one thing you would recommend our ample coalition <laughs> to change, to do the one thing, to do differently? I, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, speaking on my own behalf, I, I would basically say that, that uh, uh, France and Germany have to agree that basically what I've been talking about, uh, to, to be on the forefront of development, not only uh, sort of in, in figures, but in reality, which means industrial development, uh, i.e. research and development actually does make a difference uh, in the... In, in the uh, industrial world, if you were in the business world or in the economic world, uh, because I don't find them to be there. They're, dra they're push uh, dragging in different directions. Uh, the French are very much... Uh, uh, we, we talk about open strategic autonomy. That means that we should all be one big family. Uh, but the French would rather talk about strategic autonomy, which means that we should put everything in France. 
uh, and and uh, uh, it's it's sort of kind of leaving the, that that kind of logic behind. See to back to seeing the big picture, accepting the big picture, the leadership question, and doing things together. But at the end of the day, addressing the question I've been trying to to sort of uh, underline in my presentation. That's what I would like to see. But that, that sort of putting, and I know how difficult this is from a political point of view, to say that business is important. That's the kiss of death. Uh, it, you don't get a lot of new votes on that. Uh, that's a real challenge. That's why I try to say that, that you know, business creates jobs, that creates the taxes, that creates the social fabric. That's a fact. Uh, but it's not the fact that most politicians are willing to, to discuss. It's just taken as it happens. I think you need more of that. Mm -hmm. There was a gentleman up there, yeah. Now it's on, sorry. I once upon a time also received the Wallenberg stipendium. Thank you oh. for that, that was appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> now to my question. Uh, in the end of the 1990s, uh, there was in the EU uh, an initiative because the EU had figured out that they were falling behind the U US to create larger capital markets in the, in the EU as well. Uh, that was led by someone called uh, Baron La Lomfalosi, I think, and that resulted in, in MIFID uh, when they were trying to harmonize the capital markets in Europe. And then came the financial crisis and MIFID too, and it was more focused on consumer protection. And if you look at many of the stock-listed companies, I mean, both the Chinese companies, they are listed in the U.S., um, as well as many inno innovative European companies. I, I remember Spotify, a Swedish company listed in the U.S. I, I was actually there when they held the Swiss flag on Wall Street. Um, and uh, here in Zurich, we have uh, the sports shoe company On and so on. They're also listed in the U.S. So do you think it's possible to create competitive capital markets in Europe uh, to avoid that more companies list in the US instead of Europe? Do I have to answer? <laughs> it, I, I mean, you're, you, I mean you're, you're painting a, a very correct picture. That's reality. Uh, can, can we counteract that? I think over time we could, but then we have to start with the building blocks and they're not in place. To your point, MIFID, uh, or the, 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 the capital markets union. They, it's not in place. It's like the single market. It's not in place. I mean, we have all these fantastic ideas and we take decisions and we're not so good at implementing them. So yes, I think we could, but it's, I do agree it's, uh, to your implied answer that it's very, very difficult. But we have to try. I mean, it's a matter of leadership. We have to go out there and fight for it. And we have to come together. Please, this gentleman with the glasses there, the dark shirt. Thank you for the very nice presentation. I have a, a question about the competition. Um, you mentioned the competition is about between Europe, uh, China, and the US, but uh, India is also coming. Uh, will we go to the for fourth place, or um, as an investor, what, what do you think about India, if you can a little bit elaborate? Uh, on the role I of I India in the next I ten did years. mention India once at least. <laughs> I, I agree. I think it's an extremely relevant question. Uh, it's, um, uh, I, I mean, to many of the companies, I, I have not been to India for 10 years. Uh, I was there 10 years ago. I was there a number of times with boards. Everyone went to India. Uh, Brazil and India are the two countries that are of, of eternal promise. Yeah. Uh, and then I didn't go to India for 10 years. Now I've been twice this year. <laughs> so, new promise. But, but companies I talk to, not the least as a consequence of the geopolitical situation and, and of the Russian situation, India uh, and Modi has made a difference. I know there are lots of views of Modi, but there are some real differences. Uh, it's considered to be a significant opportunity. It's an, a place where you need to invest if you're a, a large multinational. Uh, you cannot miss that opportunity. The other markets people are looking at is, is Brazil as well, continuum. Uh, but then you have Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines uh, be, being uh, very large countries 
lots of people, large markets, uh, and, and uh, great potential. You see a movement today where Chinese companies are moving, uh, moving out production into Vietnam and out of Vietnam into the rest of the world under different brand names. So th th there are lots of games going on right now as a consequence of the geopolitical uh, sort of jigsaw puzzle being played right now. You have the microphone already, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's an advantage. Possession is... <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you for your talk. I, I have this sort of, when you th I have this image of a chicken and a rotisserie in an oven and sort of being driven on one side by China and the U.S. on the other side and Europe is in the middle. And, you know, I, I find it difficult to talk about the competitiveness of, of Europe if you, if you can't compete in the industries which are the most valuable, generating the most jobs, the most taxes, the et cetera. And across the whole value chain, coming back to Andrea's point, you know, uh, transistors, PCs, mobile phones, et cetera, Euro Europe doesn't have a national champion. And, you know, you've done a fantastic job. I mean, just as a, from a distance, I think it's fantastic what Investor has done, grooming, you know, fantastic managers and, and really making a good transition from, from old to new, as you said. But most of these, almost all these businesses were started de novo, de novo. They, they weren't, they, you know, they, they really came from nowhere. So I, I just, just wondering, did you ever think about trying to, as you've cultivated through e EQT, the private equity, something on the venture side where you, know, you could really try to foster European national champions in these industries because I just have a difficult time understanding how Europe can be competitive unless it has a competitive position in the most important industries. In principle, I, I, I agree uh, to the challenge. I, I do think we have some, some technologies where we're pretty good and so on, but uh, yeah, there, lo there is a lot missing. Have we looked at that? Yes, we have looked at that. Uh, the, the, the challenge is that we're, we're looking at very early stage, seed and the following stages, <laughs> time. You know, wh when do you actually have a mature company that does make a difference? It's taking a long time. So yes, we're trying to do that because we see what's coming out of the universities. And, and the one thing, uh, uh, um, uh, or not entrepreneurs, but, but, but inventors are not always great at, is to commercialize things. They're sort of married with their invention. So, so we try to help in that process. But as I said, that it takes too long time to address your question. Now, I, I think that uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's back to um, uh, the, the industrialization question of Europe investing more in the R&D, in uh, getting a capital market that is deeper, what not, or, or this will be very difficult to do something about. I, I agree entirely with your description. Uh, but I, as you can tell, uh, I, I believe in the future, I believe in leadership, uh, and, and I believe that's, that's why I thought it was important to say some of these things, uh, as rude as I might have sounded, mm -hmm. uh, because it's reality. It's a very ugly uh, world out there uh, uh, fr from a European uh, perspective. And if we, if we are not aware of it in this room, of course, the broader general public will not be, and then there will not be a change at all. I would love to see a deeper discussion about these things, more engagement, back to the collaboration between politics and business. In your discourse, you mentioned this special Swedish ecosystem, that, that in a way where the Wallenberg Foundation, Investor, uh, AB is, 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 is the major part of it. And I looked a little bit on, on, on what you do, and this is absolutely impressive. And um, it's private funded, right? But somehow you do tasks that look to me a little bit like, like a, a state fund might also be doing, right? But you're, you're somehow a private state fund I institution. Would that be something in order to speed up the European competitiveness that could be copied for other countries? Uh, sometimes also we in Switzerland are thinking about a state fund. The Norwegians have that and others too. Would that be a good idea to copy what you do? I, I, I think the problem with state funds is that they're state funds. 
And, and politicians yeah. have a tendency of wanting to put their fingers into it. It has to do with votes. Uh, the beauty of our system is that it's not mm. politics. Uh, and and what, is, what, what we've been able to do, I'll give one example, is that we give a, a number of scientists, we, we, we invite scientists, the leading scientists in our country, to apply for free grants. And then we have a, a uh, committee of, of Nobel uh, laureates, etc., that, that goes through all of this, and then we give, say, 25 of these money. And we say, you do whatever you please. They say roughly what they want to do, right? And we say, you do whatever you want with that money over the next five years. It should pay for you. You should pay for uh, a bunch of collaborators, your room and board, and whatnot. And the one thing we do not want to have is a report. <laughs> you do the equivalent in, in a state uh, system. Uh, it takes two years to apply. Uh, and then you have to write reports the whole time. Bureaucracy. Mm. And I'm, I, I, I know I'm rude when I say it, but it's part of the system. And that's part of the challenge. That's why we've had great success in, in working. Because we can sort of move around the obstacles of the public uh, world and, and, and uh, be much more focused on, on getting things done. Now, if you fast forward, if you can apply that thinking uh, in a broader context in Europe, in individual countries, uh, of course, that would make a difference. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that most of the capital comes out of the political system. And, and there you have the, 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 the control part. Is it also part of your investment strategy that in those premium firms you are invested that you make sure that they stay in Sweden? Do you also no, have a kind no, of no, a protectionist no. approach? No. But, but if they try to move out of Sweden, they have a problem. <laughs> 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 no, but, but in, uh, in all fairness, I mean, most of the companies we are associated with, they have their head office part of the R&D in Sweden, but uh, a great majority of the production and the markets indeed outside of Sweden. Mm. Uh, to us, it's a matter of, uh, of uh, yeah, I mean, we've been owners of these companies for up to over 100 years. Uh, for us, it's a matter of the individual company developing as well as possible. That's the only thing that's important. Okay. And hopefully we can ripe yes. some of the benefits of that in Sweden. You have a head office. What does a head office need? It needs accountants. It needs uh, great uh, support people. It needs IT. It needs all kinds of experts. If you bundle a whole bunch of those head offices in a region called Stockholm, then you have some kind of a critical mass, and then you have the big accounting firms, the big IT firms, the big this, that, and the other coming law firms, banks, uh, <laughs> coming in, offering their services. You create a, 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 a fertile environment. That is very important. We have a few minutes left. Oh, please go ahead, yes. Yes, it's working. <laughs> um, I believe in Europe. Uh, yeah. We are a bit behind. and We are at the university, and I believe in the new generation. Um, the issue is that I think there's many great ideas and skills already in Europe. Uh, but it's always, a, yeah, it, it's, it's a question of money. <laughs> and from this talk, I understand that it really stops these new generations to, we don't have the time and we just need someone to support us. Just look at, we have everyone from Zuckerberg, they just do it. like and. You mentioned the five things to focus on, and do you have three companies that you could just now tell that there's four runners on working on these five things that a student just can target? <laughs> like, just <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, it has to happen now, and I really believe we do have the skills, and it's a lot that Europe, new generation, already have. 
we are a bit behind because the politicians are not there yet. But if the market is there and there are companies who are willing to support, I think that could be a way to speed stuff. Now we are careful in listening to you. No, no, <laughs> no, I, I wish I had uh, a great answer uh, to, to your appeal. I don't, uh, but, but I think you pointed to something very important. Yeah, and, uh, but, but it, and that is, it's the whole leadership question. It's uh, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not the one that, that should or could drive this. At the end of the day, the way our system is developed, the system is developed. It's based on, on politicians taking decisions, direction, what have you. Then we find the Zuckerbergs. You're the new Zuckerberg, right? But he, it, it, the point was, it was not money. Yeah, it, it was, his need was not, or his asset was not money, it was an idea. And he was capable of, of, of doing that with basically nothing. Yeah, so, so it's not money, it's, it's, it's finding that fertile ground where young people do what Zuckerberg did. And, and the interesting thing is that that sort of ties into uh, Silicon Valley. And, and, and that fertile ground. We s see a bit of that in Helsinki, we see a bit of that in Stockholm, we see a bit of that in Zurich, we see a bit of that in Barcelona, in London, I mean Berlin, there are, but uh, no, it's not like that. I hear you. I think we used to. I don't think so any longer, in a sense. Uh, it's interesting to see who gets the Nobel Prizes. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there are lots of Europeans, all at American universities. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're, uh, but, uh, the American universities seem to be very good at getting things together. And there's something there that I can't put my finger on, uh, to your point. Is there a brain drain, drain? Less so. When you start to see entrepreneurs in these different cities that I mentioned and so on, the, there is something positive going on, much more positive than 10 years ago. But it's a long way to go. To, so I'm not that concerned of brain drain as such. And I have to say, Mr. Trump um, destroyed the market for, for immigrants. Uh, so no one can, uh, it's very difficult to get a work permit uh, any longer in the U.S. Uh, and as a consequence, I'm sure there are far less people that actually go there. So, uh, well, uh, all, all in all, less of a problem. Maybe a very last question to the gentleman there in the back. I was the first one here to dip with the heck. Well. Yes, very simply. What? rational decisions does a businessman being invested um, almost exclusively in Europe uh, take while um, waiting for Europe to become competitive at some unknown point of time in some unknown point of time? Well, I, I, uh, I mean, it's obvious that we have lots of uh, very successful companies in Europe uh, that are focusing on Europe. So, so we will together have to identify those uh, uh, from an investment point of view. But, but uh, yeah, um, to your point, uh, this is going to take time. You will invest in Chinese and American companies as alternatives. Uh, but uh, uh, in the meantime, I hope that uh, a lot of people 
spend their time and effort trying to convince their local politicians that this is important. Uh, I know it sounds really boring, uh, but, but yeah, I think it's really important uh, because if we don't raise our voices, if we don't focus on these questions, uh, we will continue to have a challenge. Mm. And then I've been trying to give this speech for no good use, and that is so unfortunate. You would have to come back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wallenberg, that was a fantastic session we had with you. Thank you so much for coming here. I am... Um, <laughs> I, I know it was not so easy to bring you. We, have, we had, you know, had discussions for uh, uh, at least three years uh, about this this event, and I, 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 you don't give too many interviews neither. So I, I looked a little bit in your internet and I saw that you have a family motto, right? Which is maybe s explains maybe why why you, it, it, that's the case, and the the family motto. Where is it? I don't see it right now. Uh, esse non videri, to be not to be seen, right? So to be not to be seen. You are there, but you don't have to be to show off. And in a way, that this is probably, that's true, that's your family motto, right? And uh, we are very grateful that you made an exception for us. Oh. And we would like to welcome you back one day. Thank you very much. Thank you.